Every day, you essentially pay your dues by doing the harder thing when it's the right thing to do. Christina, how are you? I'm good. How are you doing? I'm good. Thanks for doing this. I appreciate your time. Thanks for having me. After 47 reschedules and 88 conflicts that we have between our schedules, we're finally here. But we're here. <laughs> uh, matching schedules on the podcast, I've, become, I've found is the hardest thing because usually the people that I want to talk to are equally as busy as I am. And it takes like 13 reschedules and like 18 late. It's almost going to be like a 9 p.m. podcast, but we worked it out. And you have to deal with the time zone difference too. On oh my God, else. I'm the worst. I am the worst with time <laughs> zones. I'm the worst with basic geography and I'm the worst with time zones. Those things are just not my forte. A kid I coach told me today um, that she thinks people in Idaho speak Spanish because it's next to Spain and France. So <laughs> you have to be better than that. <laughs> That's not even like the same like continent. I was like, you know, it's in the US, right? And she's like, it is. <laughs> I was like, okay. You no, know, those, those Spanish uh, potato farmers out in Idaho and uh, pretty good. I was like, I'm glad y'all are going back to school soon. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we, need it. we won't, we won't expose this person on what grade they're in. We'll just say no. we have <laughs> young enough. She gets a little bit of a pass, but sure. old enough that I'm like, are you sure you haven't covered that yet? <laughs> <laughs> She's 17. No. <laughs> um, yeah. So I want to have you on. Obviously, we had a lot of chats leading up to the symposium and the symposium lecture you did on core stuff was very well received and people enjoyed that. So a lot of people wanted to hear uh, more of your thoughts on that. And then obviously, you have a fantastic strength conditioning background in your own life and in powerlifting and in coaching there. But you also obviously are running a lot of gymnastics things. So Obviously, we want to unpack that. And then um, you also obviously work with a, a large range of athletes, right? So I think we yes. want to talk about maybe how do we give people some help for the five, eight, 10 hours per week, not the 20, 25, 30 hours per week, which some people don't have the luxury of having. So yeah, that's where, that's where my head's at right now. Perfect. Um, can you give people the elevator pitch on where you are, who you work with, and that kind of stuff? That way we can like just set the conversation up. Sure. So I coach at Mountain Brook Gymnastics in Birmingham, Alabama, and I'm the head coach of our, or co-head coach of our whole Excel program. And we have silver through Sapphire. So Sapphire is the new level above yep. diamond that they just created. Um, I coach vault and floor mainly with them. And then I'm in charge of strength and conditioning for all of the Excel levels. And then the level six through 10. And we've got a couple of pre-elite kids in our gym too. So. That is like, that is like the gamut, right? That is like yeah. literally from like, like I'm, I'm sure you, probably, you have rec classes too and teachers for that, but like that's literally the entire way up. So is that daunting to uh, program strength and conditioning for such a wide, like variety of levels? Yes and no. Um, I think I have a pretty good handle on it and what each group needs. So it's not the programming part that gets kind of um, dicey. It's having so many kids and having to get them all through it and only having so much time in a day. So you, it's not knowing what they're doing as much as sometimes I have to have the silvers and the sapphires at the same time. And they're clearly not doing the same thing. And so that is where it's like, okay, what goes well together so they can both be working and I can keep track of everybody um, without leaving anybody just like totally unattended. Yeah, let's go there. Cause that is one of the most common emails that I get, which is like, sounds cool, Dave, but I have 34 kids <laughs> on eight different levels and I have 14 minutes to do it all. Like not 14 minutes, but exaggerating. But yeah, how do you, how do you program for a very diverse group when you may have to have overlap between practices or different mixed levels? Like, how do you even do that? So I've actually had both. I've had, um, the silvers only get like 30 minutes for conditioning time and they come at the same time as a group that has an hour or maybe 45 minutes. And so it's kind of like, they start halfway through and I've already gotten halfway through with a different group. And then I've just had like a giant mixed group where they're all on the same schedule, but like the needs are very different. Right. Um, so the biggest thing that helps me is kind of having everyone following the same general structure in terms of like everyone's on lower body at least, or everyone's on like a, you know, an energy systems or like a cardio kind of mm -hmm. day. And then breaking them into groups by their um, training level not necessarily their gymnastics level, but their actual, like where they're ready to be in their strength and conditioning program. And then I can like work with those small groups and kind of jump back and forth between them and set up my conditioning stations or my strength exercises so that they're scalable really easily. Mm -hmm. So maybe everyone's doing deadlifts, but I have barbell deadlifts with one group, one group's on kettlebells. They haven't made it to a bar yet. And one group is like doing a foam roll or hinging drill and they don't even have any weights, but they're still working the same skill. Right. So that works really well. 
Yeah. So everyone is hinging, right? But there's like, as you and I know, and maybe this is a foreign concept to many people who are just on the gymnastic side is there's like 16 different ways to do a hinge movement. and All of them are effective (laughs) for posterior hamstring stuff. And so if you can understand why somebody would do a kettlebell deadlift versus why somebody else would have to do just a basic drill, maybe they're just at different training ages, you're still getting a training effect. And now the follow-up question that people have to that is like, well, isn't one person's time being wasted by not actually barbell deadlifting where one person who's doing a kettlebell is not getting stronger, quote unquote. Like, I feel like that's the premise I hear now is like, okay, we're adopting it. But like, if they're not drenched in sweat and dying, it's not working. So can you kind of share there? Yeah. So I think the easiest way to think of it is you wouldn't go straight from level three bars to trying to learn a stalter like in the next practice. There's progressions that you work through to get there. And if you think of like a barbell deadlift or maybe one of the Olympic movements as like your level 10 elite goal, and you think of this hinge drill where they're just learning how to like go through that movement pattern correctly as level two, Mm. um, then you can kind of build your progression that way, the same way you would with gymnastic skills. I think that's a big one. And it also makes it really easy when you do have those groups that you've divided your kids into by training level. Some people are just going to be more ready on a given exercise. And it's really easy to be like, hey, you go to that group just for this one exercise. It's all already set up. Um, You're a little ahead. Or if you need to regress somebody back down and get the hinge pattern back, you can move them back down to the kettlebells or back down to the other drill and kind of just go back and forth. And it works really well and makes it flow a little better. Right. And on that analogy, you could have a bar, you know, workout and some kids are really great at giants. They come really smooth. They're walk, they're working blind changes, right? You have other kids who are really struggling on giants. They're still doing, you know, spotted giants or strap bar work. Like it doesn't make one gymnast better nor worse than the other, of course, but everyone's just got different challenges. You go to in bars and that same girl who's struggling on giants has a beautiful free up handstand while somebody else is barely getting to 45. So I think that's a really great way to explain it, which is like in the same way you have different levels on skills, there's different levels in competency or training ages, right? You might have somebody who comes from a different gym and their training age for gymnastics is 12 years, but their training age for lifting is zero. That person needs all the basics versus girls who have been on your team for two, three, seven years. They like, they know how to pick up kettlebells. They know how to load the barbells up. They know how to do all their tri sets. They have their programs. They've written the weights down. Like they really get it. It's just, it's just teaching people. It's working through like everything else. We have that going on right now. We've got quite a few kids who have their high level kids that have moved from other gyms and out of state, somebody, you know, a parent got a new job in Birmingham and now they're here. And they're like level nine, 10 kids, but they've never touched a weight before because they didn't do that at their gym. And so kind of starting them where they need to be. And on certain exercises, of course, if you get into body weight stuff, that's more like traditional gymnastics, they're caught up. I mean, they're, they're great, but then like they've never done a deadlift. So I got to start them at square one on that, even though they're not at all weak, they're super strong kids. They just don't know that movement. So. Yeah, I'm laughing internally as you talk because we have a running joke at Champion of like watching the high level elite gymnast skip sideways for the first time and try to go back to skipping and like basic running. It's absolutely incredible. And I love you all if you're listening to this podcast, but we literally have like, and this is like, I don't mean to like say who we work with, but like we have like elites, level tens, national qualifiers, division one national champions. They literally can't skip and run or do basic jumps, but they can do like lead up double doubles. It's the funniest thing in the world. Yeah, that's something that uh, it helps that I work with a lot of Excel kids and we do have a little bit of a different schedule and we can kind of focus on some different things. But like skipping the general stuff and I mean, the like the basic motor development, the skipping and the running um, or just not doing it a lot. You'd be surprised at how much just bringing that back helps everything else, like just general coordination. And they can do so many just really, really hard things that nobody else can do and they can't do these super basic things. Mm. And it's, it's crazy to me mm. every time so, one of them, yeah, like you said, can't skip. I'm like, what are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> we missed that class in rec. <laughs> it's okay. Yeah. Um, so within your basic programs, like obviously we're talking about deadlifts, but like, what are like the big rocks that you feel like, okay, I'm a gymnastics coach listening to this. She sounds smart. I want to finally do this for the first time. Like what big movements should people be focusing on, you know, with their programs? I'm going to say the two biggest ones and the two that when I first grabbed the higher level kids in our gym who had, you know, already gotten to these higher levels, but they'd been super gymnastic specific the whole time. The two biggest things that I thought were super important exercises and that I knew they couldn't do correctly because just watching them move, I'd seen it were a squat pattern and a hinge pattern. Mm. Um, and I'd say squats first, Obviously, we know they're a good lower body strength builder. I mean, that's what we use them for. But they're so good for so many other things. Hip internal rotation that you need, but we never train in gymnastics because you're always trying to turn things out. Mm-hmm. Um, dorsiflexion, 
they're all pointing their toes all the time, walking around on high toe, that kind of thing. And they lose their ability to dorsiflex from yep. never doing it. And so it kind of forces them in a low impact situation to work on those things so that when you get to the high impact situations, you land something short, you land something in a low squat, you're not in trouble because you've never trained it. Now you're strong at the bottom of that squat for those bad landings and just building up general strength to land safely, um, mm. period. Yep. Um, and then the other big one is any hinge mo uh, pattern, but really deadlifts are probably the most common one. I think the one I use the most and build around mm. because it, it works as a piece of so many other things mm -hmm. if you can get a good hinge. Um, and that one, one, we need the strength there again in that movement pattern. But for me, getting kids to learn to hinge correctly and use it in strength training, it helps them learn so many other skills like back springs. Mm. I think if you use that hinge motion in a back handspring, one, it's a lot more powerful. Yeah. Two, we're now avoiding overstressing our low back by hit, like only bending there. And there's just, I don't know, those two exercises to me are just the two like most birds you could kill with one stone yeah. and two different exercises for almost every event. Totally agree. Absolutely. And I think they're, they make the most sense for most coaches to be like, I see where that shows up, jumping and landing back handsprings, all that kind of stuff. Um, and I like this. Yeah. So let's kind of talk about now, like, okay, we have this like either mixed group or we have these different training ages. Let's maybe give three examples of either like an introductory exercise and like a moderate and advanced exercise for squatting. And then we'll do hinging as well to kind of keep this practical. So like, what's your like starting, like uh, I almost gave one away, <laughs> what's your starting squat exercise and then like moderate and then like your most advanced training age. I'd say for us, we don't have a rack in our gym at all to mm -hmm. use barbells for back squats. So I never barbell back squat them. So that's not even a goal we're trying yeah. to get to. But I love to start with like a stack of panel mats or a low block and work goblet squats first. Yep. Um, and I actually find squats to be one of a few exercises that I give them a weight pretty early on, even yep. if it's really light, because I think it helps balance you out I and agree. it makes it easier to like learn the motion um, correctly. Yep. But I give them the mat as a thing to literally sit down on and stand up at first. Um, once we can do that, then we kind of lower the mats a little bit. And I'm like, all right, just tap it. Like, don't put any weight on it. Just barely touch it. And then we pull them away. And goblet squat um, is probably our main squatting pattern yep. that we use. And if I have a kid who truly cannot get it, I'll get like a big stability ball, put it on the wall behind their back, still hand them the weight. And let them slide down the ball and back up. And that's a big one that kids just can't get it. Like That's what we go to. Sure. Yeah. And that's a great way, right? You start at the goblet squat, right? And you say, okay, if it doesn't really work, let's work our way back to a, a wall squat or something like that. Or some kids struggle with ankle mobility. You can elevate their heels. Then you have unlimited yep. progressions, right? You could do like front rack squats or doubles, like whatever you want. There's a billion more advanced, but 90% of the kids are going to need a, gob a heavy goblet squat and then some sort of like regression. And then, so you said kind of kettlebell deadlifts. Is that like your ideal entry point? And then you kind of work your way backwards to a dowel. Is that what I heard, right? I prefer to start my deadlifts with this um, foam roller deadlift drill that yep. I, I don't know if I made it up or someone else did it, but you basically take the foam roller and against your wrist and put it on your thighs and you have to roll it down your legs and roll mm. it back up. Mm. And so it forces you to kind of keep tension and use your core. And that's what I like about it as a um, starting thing. And as soon as they can do that, then I start giving them weights. Uh, but I do like single leg before I even go to two kettlebells. Yep. I think a lot of kids just get it more. And especially in gymnastics where they don't understand neutral and they are, they've been taught so long, um, not to stick their booty out basically. And so they're trying to like round over the entire time. And I think the foam roller and forcing them to drive their hips back and find that neutral position and still be engaging their core and then going single leg, they have an easier time keeping their spine neutral. I don't know why. I don't know, but they do. Oh, <laughs> they do it better there. And then when you can do it there, then you put both feet on the ground and you get one kettlebell in each hand. And I think that's like the perfect spot because you can stay there if you've got heavy enough kettlebells you don't ever have to go to a bar mm. you can load that one up um we have bars in our gym and i like to use them and it helps me with uh, the number of, of pieces of equipment that we have and the number of kids all trying to work out at the same time to be able to put the more advanced kids over on the barbell and load it up wherever they need to and they pull plates on and off and it works well to have a couple of kids rotating in and out but that's the top of that maybe we do um deadlifts from the floor sometimes rdls sometimes i think it's easier to teach the rdl first and then mm. learn it from the ground but yeah yeah really, to that point, and 
to that point on equipment, like you were saying, is like sometimes this is budget friendly, right? So like you could if you could invest in like we literally bought 10, 10 years ago, two sets of like 10 kilo, 14 kilo, 18 kilo, and 20 kilo dumbbells or kettlebells. And we literally have never needed anything more. Like right. heavy 20 kilo, that's 44 pounds, that's 88 pounds on a single like RDL, like for sets of eight, like you're gonna roast your hamstrings and like the and the, the oldest girls, but the youngest little peanuts are literally just barely picking up the 10, 10 you know, yeah. kilo to learn how to deadlift properly. So and they never go out of style, right? They're always cheap. They're always like, like drive to the place and pick them up yourself. So you don't got to pay for shipping. We did that like here in Rhode Island. So it worked out pretty well. Amazon Prime has them. Yeah, exactly. So, I mean, you <laughs> get free working, shipping on something also like has that. Them too, just in a plug, but. <laughs> yeah. I would say like, that's where, uh, when we first started, one of the big issues we ran into was I finally got the go ahead from my head coach. And she was like, I don't know what you're going to use. We don't have yeah. anything. Yeah. And you have like $400 and you can whatever you can figure out. And I'm like, okay, where can I Facebook buy used equipment? Place. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, if we have a local place here that I was able to go buy some stuff used. Um, I think I got a few things from Facebook Marketplace. I was able to get like one new piece of, I mean, just really, I kind of like had to look, Perhaps. yeah, and make absolutely. good use of it. Yeah, we spent $600 on the start of our um, like kettlebells, dumbbells, a couple ones from like, you know, parents' basements, they definitely weren't using anymore, you know, mm -hmm. a couple of donations here and there. And we quickly got to like a pretty decent sized, um, you know, set of everything we needed. If you're creative enough, if you understand strength conditioning programming, you really don't need that much equipment. You don't. Particularly for gymnasts. No. You get some bands and some good kettlebells and you can do almost anything you could do in a real gym. So. I agree. I agree. <laughs> and especially like when their training is just so low, like, they're, like a drop in the bucket of general strength training is going to make them not only have a lot of benefits, but also probably will get the training effect of like some challenging soreness that you're looking for in a good way. Yeah, definitely. Um, are you guys lifting year round? Do you guys lift only in the off season summer? Do you guys lift preseason fall? Like what's that situation like? All year round. Uh, I thankfully am in charge of it all year round. So that kind of helps things. And it does, you know, it ebbs and flows and there's a lot more like true strength work happening in summer. And as we get into the season, it's, more like power based and yes we're still using the weights but we're not necessarily doing like the super heavy stuff it's more how quickly can you move this weight and that kind of thing and then of course more gymnastic specific stuff kind of tends to like take over during that mm -hmm. time mm -hmm. um and a little bit more on the conditioning end of things mm -hmm. during season to make sure we're in shape for floor routines and that kind of stuff yeah and just to make you all understand like conditioning is a separate bucket in the actual true yes. strength world like people i think in, in gymnastics it's like oh we're conditioning it's like all their strength all their things but like strength is strength conditioning is like energy system stuff like that so when she yes. says actual conditioning it's not like she's just actually doing the regular <laughs> gymnastic stuff it's like actual biking and all that kind of stuff so um cool what's that what's that like maybe a sample summer workout look like for you guys for maybe let's go with like some of the excels so my higher level excels work with the same program that my um, higher level, like, what do they call it now? DP kids do. Yeah. The difference is simply in how many days they get. They get the same number of strength days. Um, because just with my Excel group, I feel like they need that the most. Um, that's going to fill the most buckets. We can put it in a circuit form if we need more like cardio. We can take more rest when we need more general strength work. We can, you know, build in all kinds of things to kind of make it fit the goals that we need. But that's my thing. Like, they all have at least three days up at the higher level Excel. Um, and obviously the optionals have more than three days, but that way, like there are three days that are dedicated truly to strength work. Yep. And then the big difference is that these higher level kids or the kids over on the DP side are going to have more days where they do gymnastics specific um, and where they do more like energy system stuff. Mm -hmm. And that, I mean, that's really the biggest difference between the two, but the, the actual just like strength and conditioning program is the same for those first three days. And then adding on to that and the number of extra time that you have little extra rotations, like the girls that I coach still do gymnastics specific stuff, your hollow rocks, your shaping and all of that kind of stuff. But we fill it into maybe like a 10 minute at the beginning of each event situation, rather than having like a whole 30 to 45 minute rotation mm -hmm. that's dedicated to that kind of stuff that you may see over on the DP side. Yep. That makes sense. Um, and is it all structured the same? Is it like, you know, you have 30 to 45 minutes and it's like all your power stuff first and all your general strength work, then energy system stuff, like the classic yep. kind of strength conditioning, or yep. is it something else? That's usually what we do. Uh, especially at this time of year, I'll have whatever my bigger strength or maybe power movement is. And I'll usually pair it with two things just because that kind of works with the number of kids that we have that are, on the same page, but not, um, 
they're not taking away from your ability to do that movement. So they kind of serve as your rest period. Mm -hmm. And they also make it so I can make it into a circuit and everybody can kind of start on something different and get around. And we're still getting that big main movement done um, with a little bit of rest built in. Everybody's still moving. Nobody's like sitting on the ground waiting their turn or anything like that. And then I tend to do the second half of the workout. It's not really half. It's probably more like the second 70% of the workout in more of a circuit format so that mm. everybody keeps moving and everybody's got enough equipment to get everything done. And it gives me a chance to move around and kind of like pick one thing that I want to focus on me coaching. Mm. So let's say we're doing deadlifts. Like that's my main focus as a coach. The other two things that I paired it with are something they can do. Like they know how to do it. They're good at it. They don't need me to literally be watching them the whole time. And I can spend my focus coaching that deadlift and making sure that we're really learning it and learning the technique correctly. Mm, for sure. So say you're watching deadlifts, what are maybe uh, two other stations that they're doing on their own? Like what are those sets and reps of all those things kind of look like? So um, this month, starting at the beginning of August, I have, we're doing sets of six on deadlifts and I change it by the week, um, how many sets we've got, we kind of build up and then we taper back off. Um, so we've got sets of six on deadlifts. They have to add weight to every set. We don't really have time to like sit there and warm up a deadlift and then like right. find our working weight and then like figure it out. So what I just have them do is just like we load the bar to something that everybody can start with. And then from there, they add weight each set. And it's a good like quick way to get them through it and still make sure that we're, you know, overloading as we go. Mm -hmm. And then I'll usually pair a hinge with something else that I want them to learn that they need to hinge on. They may not think of. So maybe we're doing like banded broad jumps with our mm. deadlifts or we're doing um broad jumps all the way across the floor that go with it something like that and then i'll usually do it um the third exercise is something if i've got something that requires a lot of jumping or like it's going to get their heart rate up i try and bring it back down on mm. the one that goes right before the deadlifts again so um right now they have a dead hang yep so Sick. they were still doing grip strength but they're relaxed a little bit they're still working but they're you know their legs are resting on that one and that's kind of how I paired those three up. Yeah, I dig it. And for those that are maybe listening and are still kind of new to terminology, those are called the sending sets when you kind of have like, you know, slowly adding more and more versus what you're referring to before as a top set when you would work up to maybe like a, a three straight working set across. So I think we have a mixed audience here of like brand news to like strength conditioning coaches that are probably digging in the weeds a little bit. So just for that. And then the other piece of it too is I think everyone's like looking for the exact program to make everyone do everything perfect. And there's so many ways to build <laughs> different tri sets or double sets based on their goal and like different exercises. Like there's, I've seen plenty of strength coaches who are like, you know, um, like a champion a lot of times it's like deadlift, like, uh, some sort of like leg lower active mobility drill. And that works just as fine as someone doing a power stuff and they put the power before. So I think people unfortunately want to be spoon fed a perfect answer, but I think the reason I'm intentionally dancing around the principles is because that's really the best way to learn how to program. Like you should understand why gymnasts should lift and what the benefits are. And then you should learn from a strength coach or hire a strength coach or learn it yourself. I don't know. Um, take a, take your whatever exam. I'm not going to plug an exam, but um, you should learn these things for yourself because it's better to learn the principles on how to program and why to program. Like why do six reps versus 10 reps or why do a tri set versus a straight set? Like, and I think that's important. And most people just unfortunately don't want to do that work, but that is where the future of gymnastics is going in my opinion. And one thing I think that it, it makes such a big difference if you actually understand the principles behind it is that what works for me and my gym and my setup is not going to work for every other gym. And so if right. I just feed you my perfect program, and you're like, well, I don't have that and I don't have that and I don't have that. You're going to get frustrated and give up on it versus if I'm like, OK, you need this. It doesn't matter what implement you use, but you need something to add resistance and you need to go through these movement patterns and you understand why they're important and what movements in gymnastics they relate to. Mm. You can put it together in a way that makes sense for you. So that's it. Yeah. I've, I've come to the point where I just think this, the more simple and the more consistent, the better for where we are in gymnastics yeah. right now. Like you and I and Dan and people are like, we're massive dorks. And we're like, we're thinking about really things that are like maybe either not coming for two more years in terms of like complex periodization or like actual working through phases and stuff. Or they only honestly work with like the top, I don't know, like the highest level college and elite kids. Like they're probably not applicable for the younger ones because they don't need that much to make them train. We're talking about kids that are highly trained and need an extra 1%, but 90% of 95% of the people out there literally just need two days of a basic strength program with squat hinge, split pelvis, single leg, upper body pushing and pulling, general core, some loaded carries and sleds and call it a day. Like that's, that's literally all you need. And it's not that I'm saying I'm like, 
we're trying to talk over people's heads. It's that literally gymnasts have just been not doing anything for so long. If you had one day per week or two days per week, they see a massive performance increase in terms of how strong they feel. Yeah. I said the, the higher level DP kids that I work with, they practice in our gym five days a week. And some of them come twice a day on a couple of days of the week. So we're not doing nine strength sessions. We're doing three. You know, and they're working around with everything else that they need in there. Uh, more gymnastic specific, if that's what they need. Maybe it's the kid trying to go elite needs a four pass routine. So we've got to now condition her to that level versus what the level sevens need with their two pass routine and that kind of stuff. And again, like what if I was writing the perfect program for gymnastics on paper, it would not be what I actually do in practice because I can't like I don't have yeah. what I would want you know to do that dream program and i don't have the space or the time or the small enough group so i gotta go with what i can actually do and what's practical in our setting yeah and i think the more that i talk with many different strength coaches whether they're working in the club setting whether they're working in the, the college elite setting is like you can have benefits from literally doing anything like we have a champion kids come the the dp kids come one day per week for like an hour hour and 15 minutes as part of our performance program and they get massive benefits right then we have obviously the girls that are home from college they're doing two three days per week and then you have the you know the crazy you know hardcore people that are the elites and they're doing much more involved programs but it's scaled to their level so they get a benefit for what they want i think that it's really intimidating for gymnastic coaches right now because either it's an educational gap uh it's an ego gap or they don't know where to start and i think like literally if you just start with give up one day of general gymnastics conditioning to a general strength program and understand the basics and do three to four sets of eight to 12 like the most classic boring set and rep range like you'll see a huge benefit you really will yeah I, that when we first started when we first transitioned the dp group into that and in, in our gym that's kind of where i started them and it was august of 2020 so like we just came back of off that whole break um they didn't really know what they're doing but we're also like kind of close enough to season starting in december for judges cup that i'm like i like we can't run through an entire strength summer program like i would like to do or we're not going to make it to season we're mm. not going to be ready mm. um conditioned enough and that kind of thing and i really did i just kind of was like all right we're gonna like kind of bring some strength training in here we're gonna add a little bit i'm gonna try and get you through the most basic movement patterns correctly but also i'm not going to take away what you were doing too much because that's where we're at and that's what mm. we need to do this year and then you know after that year and after that season was over i was able to kind of you know add more and and bring them up to where we are now but the first little bit and it made a huge difference and all we did was really you know tweak a few things here and there and kind of build on what they were already doing but that was enough that they saw big improvements and they um had less injuries which is a big part of it too and what's that what's that process like of trying to get that ball rolling because i think the people listening to this podcast are the ones who get really excited about starting a strength program they want to learn they want to try it they go to their head team coach who's a little bit more old school or their gym and they're like yeah we're not doing that that's dumb they need more leg lifts like this is stupid we just need like 500 squat jumps and the person's like all right like why even bother so like what was that like culturally trying to get the ball going and getting momentum behind why it's beneficial I think one of the advantages that I had is that I had an entire group, you know, from developmental level with the silvers all the way up to some higher level kids that I was able to be doing it with. And somebody was able to look over and be like, huh, like they're healthy. Mm. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like they look like they're doing okay. Perfect they're healthy. Thing, they're, yeah. they're doing well in meets and that kind of stuff. And so that was kind of, I think really worked to my advantage to have that and be able to be like, look, we're doing okay. Yeah. Um, but it did, it took me, a couple of years from the time that I first started asking to where I finally kind of went out. And, and like I said, August of 2020, like I couldn't have planned COVID, but COVID worked in my favor because we're suddenly in a new situation. They've never had such an extended break. They came back kind of trying to do what they'd been doing. And it, you know, they weren't ready for it anymore after having been out for so long and so many kids grew and then, you know, running into new problems they hadn't had to deal with. Mm. And that's kind of what worked out for me is that, everything kind of aligned. Um, sure. But again, I, I had to work on it for years. And even now that I've been, um, we're at exactly two years now of kind of when I took it over, there's still things that we are constantly kind of having to like discuss and we don't always agree on things. And it's kind of a, sometimes it's a give and take and maybe yeah. it's not what I would want to do, but I know like in order to keep the rest of it, I got to like let this one thing go <laughs> yeah. um, or give, give here and there and kind of, yeah and work with my head coach. And yeah, I mean, it's, it's a constant challenge and I am always still learning like how to yeah. 
know when to skill, like which battles to skills. choose. Yeah, yeah, for yeah. sure. I think we all struggle with that a little bit, just kind of like working in the mix of different opinions, and it's it's actually healthy. You know, it's good to have that kind of back and forth and stuff. Um, yeah. The next thing I really want to get your uh, thoughts on is is a lot of questions on the podcast about you know managing Excel groups who don't have you know honestly more than like maybe ten hours per week. They have like eight six hours per week, and it's this balance with obviously they're doing Excel because they have other interests, whether it's school, other sports, social activities, but at the same time they want to see progress. They want to have fun. They want to be healthy. They want to be safe. They want to be with their friends, and so. Um, I have experience in the Excel side a little bit, but I'm, I think you're probably the better one to talk about it is how do you fit? First of all, what are you trying to get in in six to eight hours? And then maybe after that, we'll dive more. But like, what are you trying to get in in six to eight hours of two days per week of practice with these athletes? So I'd say our silvers come, I think, six and a half hours. Uh, so it's about a three hour practice with a few minutes here and there on it. And then our Sapphire group is going to be coming 15 yep. starting this um, this month of August, when we go back to our fall schedule, which is not a lot, that's like level nine and a half gymnastics yeah. is what I'll call it. Yeah. Um, they've got to earn bonus and all that stuff. So like 15 hours doing that level of gymnastics is still oh, not tough. that much. Yeah. Um, and they did really high level skills in diamond on 12. We made it work. Yep. So I think the biggest thing you can do there is one, have really good basics. Cause if your basics are good, you can build much more easily. Um, two, pick out what is the most important. So certain skills build into everything. You've got a good round off back handspring, you know, you're kind of unlimited in what you can put together. It helps your chinko vault if you want to go that way. It helps if you want to learn twisting, it helps if you want to learn double flipping. All of it comes out of a good round off back handspring. So I think really spending time on the big blocks of the foundational kind of skills and not getting too excited and wanting to chunk things too early, which I think in Excel is a big challenge because you do have kids who are more there for fun, but they still want to do skills and convincing them that you have to like build up to those are sometimes a little bit of a challenge. Um, if you're more free spirited kids, that's what I like to, to think that ours are. Um, but like you said, they want to learn. Yeah. Very rarely do I have a kid who's truly just in there for the fun of it and doesn't ever want to get better and doesn't care how they do to meet. Yeah. Even in Excel, even when they have never been on a compulsory team, they came straight out of rec to like Excel Silver. They want to do well. Um, they don't always understand how to get there and you have to teach them that part, but they want to be successful. And I think guiding them into that and having your own system and knowing what's the most important way to get there and still having fun, like balancing it with fun, big part of keeping them around and keeping them in the sport, of course, but in a safe way, in a way that does get them to that higher level skill. It's easy to play in silver or play in any developmental level, I think, and never fix the round up by can spring because it doesn't matter yet because they can do it, right? And right. then you that kid makes it to diamond and like all of a sudden they want to learn double back and you can't. Mm. The round up by can spring is not going to work. Um, yep. They learned it with their head out and now they can't fix it because they've been doing it that way for 10 years or whatever mm. it is. Um, mm. They can't learn the Yurchenko vault that they've dreamed of doing because the round up by can spring is crooked. And they don't yeah. understand how to fix it. And you don't know how to fix it <laughs> or whatever it may be. But I will say the higher level you coach, um, working backwards is huge. Like as I started getting higher and higher level kids and being able to work backwards and see where I messed up, you know, five years ago when I had that kid and they were in that developmental level. And I was like, well, that didn't work out. I got to do better with this next group of kids. And I got to pick out this mistake and I got to fix it now because – now we can't, we can't fix it. It's too late. The habits stuck like that. We just got to work with it, um, do what we can with it now. But again, mm -hmm. back to those principles, understanding the sport, understanding what makes certain skills work. And I think the biggest part of it is picking out the most important part and kind of, you have to like filter out um, some of the noise that comes from the DP program because it doesn't apply to you. And as I said, going back and being able to pick out the most important parts and applying mm -hmm. them, like that's a big thing. Yeah, I'm, I'm a pretty firm believer and I've looked across a lot of programs that regardless of whether you're literally in a one hour per week rec class or you're in like a 35 hour per week elite, like 33% of your time should be on basics. Like 33% should be on physical prep, which is like flexibility, strength, conditioning, all that. And then 33% should be on basics and developmental stuff, whether that's in a warm up, whether that's in a, an event basic section or stuff like that. And then 33% can be on the fun skills. And obviously those, those wax and wane based on the time of the season and stuff like that. But um, I've met some amazing Excel coaches who are able to make you know strength as fun as you can obviously in basics as fun as you can and you still have time to 
chuck the skills and have fun. But I think this comes down to like the culture you build in your gym about why basics are important and why standards are important and why you have to like really be dedicated to focus on what you're doing. But also, you know, gyms and environments that take it seriously. I think sometimes unfortunately what happens in the Excel program is it kind of, this is a fault of the gym club sometimes that it kind of gets thrown to the side a little bit about like, we'll fit you in when we can on events and like blah, blah, blah. And like, they don't really have the time and the space and the equipment they need. And the coaches don't get the education they deserve, right? A lot of the, the, it, whether it's the rec classes or whether it's the Excel coaches, they really don't get the same um, dedication towards education. So how in the world are they going to know the best strength finishing, the best drills, the best technique? And so as a club owner, as a team owner, you have to give equal respect to both programs and empower that coach to then be excited for the kids. Then the kids get excited. And I think that's, that's what all good programs do, but it's for sure super important in Excel. I think that's a huge part of it. I know in our gym, as much as we try to make them equal and equivalent and all that good stuff and that both are really positive and, and like valid tracks to get through gymnastics, we still have a little bit of, you know, parents have a bad opinion of it. And maybe they came from a different gym and it was different where they came from. And maybe that's just what they see looking down from, you know, the bleachers. And that's what their observation is, even if it's not true. But I will say like, I don't always get to go to some of the educational conferences and things. And me being the nerdy person that I am, I will like figure out ways um, <laughs> to learn stuff. Like I look on, you know, your resources or Nick's resources and some of the different things that are out there. And I am glad that I have enough of a, I think, educational background to be able to sift through and go, this is important to me. This works for my kids. This is what I need. This works with the equipment that I have and the time that I have and the resources that I have, because it is only just, it's just me on any event mm. at any given time. And it's just Kendall on bars. Um, we can't double spot something like we're not in the same place at the same time. We're split up. So yeah. kind of like looking through that stuff and going, okay, I know that's a great drill. I can't do it. What's the main concept here? What mm. is the takeaway? How can I make that happen with what mm. I have? Um, and so coaching more high level kids and going backwards helped me a ton. Um, and sometimes if I don't have anything going on in the gym, I watch like the elite kids and I'm like looking and I'm going, okay, what looks different about that? Like, why are they able to do that skill? Sure. Uh, and what can I do with it? And I think another thing I should have mentioned earlier, uh, Excel coaches being okay with having a slower timeline to get to the same place will help you a ton because you do have fewer hours but if you can make sure the kid has the basics and that they're strong enough for the skill and that they understand big concepts, whether it's like tapping or shaping or snapping or whatever that skill requires a lot of, they'll pick it up faster. Like you can build the pieces of it. And then one day when they're ready, just be like, all right, try it. And like nine times out of 10, I feel like they get it because they mm -hmm. got all the building blocks along the way, even if they didn't realize it. Yeah. There's so many important things popping into my head, like on this conversation. One is that if you build that culture around basics and strength, honestly, as those being like important parts of it, you learn skills faster. You can pick up stuff faster. You can have more fun. You can be safer when you compete and stuff like that, or if you don't want to compete. So that is kind of like the sell for why you need to have that, that cultural, because it's, it's about safety and just being able to, you know, oh, that looks like a fun skill. Can I learn that? You're going to be able to do that probably if you have that baseline level of strength and basics. And on the second piece of it, I think back to the conversation of looking and sharing is, I kind of, I see both sides. So one is that there's, there's for sure some gyms that have massive cultural problems with thinking that Excel is somehow below the other levels or something is like, oh, that's where you go. And like, you're not good enough for you, like burn out, you're injured. Like that's frankly bullshit. And I'll say it straight out. Like I hate cultures that have that because it's about the kids goals. They want to do skills. They, I mean, they want to do school stuff. They want to have another sport. They want to do that. So as a culture, the competitive side of gymnastics has to do a much better job at not looking down quote unquote on the Excel program. And on the other side of that though, is that I think the Excel program and the coaches inside of there, they need to go the extra mile and like know good technique and know how to program strength conditioning and know why some skills are going to be better or worse or not safe. And like you said, like sometimes there's a lot of just like chucking it because we want to have fun. Like the fastest way to not have fun is to get hurt and then you yeah. never come back and you get a mental block. So like I see both sides. I see like the cultural side has to support Excel more, but I also think you need to do yourself a favor as Excel coaches and go out of your way to learn basic technique and stuff like that. So I, I for sure see both sides of it. And I, I said, you know, take the slower timeline and that kind of thing. And one thing that I see a lot of in Excel, at least in our region, I don't know if this is across the country or not, is a lot of people, especially in like the lower levels, your your bronze kids, your silvers, your golds, especially where they just want to score really, really high and win the meet. And they are not really like looking forward long term to how do I get this kid to learn the hard skills one day. And so they're doing like 
floor routines using handstand forward rolls as their acro skills. And sure, they scored nine nine, yeah. but then like that kid doesn't have a round up back handspring yet, yeah. and they're they're twelve years old. Like, you know, you got to get there eventually. And so, one thing that I do in our particular Excel group is that we try to make sure that we are on target. And I don't mean that we do compulsory skills necessarily or make people do uh, cookie cutter routines where everyone has to have this and everyone has to have this, but we try to follow the compulsory levels a little bit like, okay, level four is around up by cancering. We should at least be doing that in gold. Like my gold kids need to have that. And that's mm. what we need to get to gold and that kind of thing. So we do in silver and gold compete harder skills than most of the other people we see at meets and we don't win. And like, you know, sometimes kids are a little sad about that. And we try and explain to them at that age, like, Hey, I know this is sad, but do you see that Sapphire kid doing layout souks mm. that no one else in diamond in our state can do? Like, that's where you're going. You just got to be patient. You know, you'll start winning in platinum when the other kids, they, they ran out of steam, you know, they couldn't get there. So Mm, yeah and it the goes for all, hard yeah yeah it is very hard for sure and, and it kind of triggers that thought for me which is this goes for all of gymnastics but it's particularly important but like level setting expectations is really important for for these kids based on like not based on their talent level or anything else is based on like what their goal is and what they want to put into the to the gym and i think there's nothing wrong with talking about level leveling expectations and understanding like hours in probably equals more progress or not and you know i think as long as you can approach it in a healthy way which is like what are your goals what do you want out of the sport do you want to do gymnastics and play tennis and do track and play band or do you just want to do gymnastics because it's your favorite thing and you love it and both are okay you just got to realize that if, if you choose the first and you come for six hours per week we can't really get all the time in for all the strength and all the safety stuff and all the drills and all the, the actual equipment time versus someone who's coming 15 or 20 hours per week. And I think like you say is, is understanding the pace might not be as rapid, but if their goals are, I want to come have fun and play around with new skills, then we can get that done in six to eight hours per week. But you can't want, you, you can't want something that you're not putting in the work for. And then when the outcome doesn't come, you can't be upset that you don't have that. That could catalyze you to want to do more hours, but like, that's the only problem I see friction sometimes is when someone's like, well, I want the high level goal, but I only want to come eight hours. And it's like, that's where the challenge is yeah. for coaches because coaches are like, okay, now I'm stuck between a rock and a hard place. And we do have a little bit of that. I do have my kids who truly are just there for fun. And like I said, they yeah. want to do well at meets, but maybe they want to compete cartwheel, cartwheel and platinum. And they don't really have a flight scale on me, but that works within the Excel guidelines. And that's okay with us. Like we talk about, you know, what is your specific goal? Let's meet it. Let's be realistic about the amount of time you're here because you do do dance team and you miss half of your practice time or whatever. Um, and sometimes those conversations are not super fun to have because you do have a kid who like puts on paper these lofty, lofty goals and you know they're doing three sports and you're like, look, like, mm. I don't want to say you can't. I'm never, I don't want to like, you know, heart, uh, kill your dream here. I will work on it as long as you want to work on it. But we got to like either come more or maybe push this off a year, like we need longer to get there or whatever it may be to get to it. But uh, we want them to be safe. And I don't want them to be disappointed because we get to the first meet of the season and they're not, they don't have all that list of skills that they thought they were going to have. Right. And it was never realistic in the first place. But I want them to know that like, I'm going to put in the effort as long as you're going to put in the effort, we'll get there. Maybe not in two months, it might take a six, but like, we'll do it. And one thing that I think really helps our group is we have progress reports that we do quarterly. Yes. And we put all of the levels on it, even if, you know, if it's a silver who just came from rec, they can see the diamond or the sapphire stuff on the same paper. And mm. they can be looking now at like, that's what I need to be able to do to get there. And I think right. being able to see it that far in advance, and we do have attendance on there. We don't have any requirements. Like if you miss a certain amount of practices, you're in trouble or whatever, but we do, we have it on there. And we keep up with it so that parents who maybe don't get it, like their kids scoring really well. And we're like, well, we really can't move them up. They're not ready. And they're like, why? And I'm like, well, they come to one practice a week. That's not going to cut it in the next level. And you're able to have that kind of stuff objectively documented for parents and for the kids, especially the older kids who kind of understand it a little bit more. And they see where they're going and they understand how stuff builds and how they get to that higher level. So it doesn't feel like you're picking favorites or like, you know, some kids are getting. Yeah special treatment yeah that <laughs> yeah and, and the commonality of goals is so important as you get as you have less and less hours to work with clearly establishing the goals that this person has and why they're involved in gymnastics is so important like 
it, again, this is for all gymnastics, but it particularly comes up in Excel because sometimes the dynamic between what a parent wants and what a coach wants and what a, a gymnast wants at that level is sometimes very challenging. Whereas maybe when you're, when you're in like level eight or level nine, it's very clear what you're trying to work for. Like we're trying to compete, we're trying to learn skills, we're trying to move up. But in Excel, sometimes it's like the gymnast wants fun with friends twice a week. They want fun with friends twice a week, doing some gymnastics and fun skills and, and kind of doing some things that keeps them healthy. Whereas their parents think they want like the next level, the next level, the next level to move up. And a coach is like, I just want to keep you safe. You know? So like there, there has to be a constant fluid, open communication between like, what is the goal? And does that change year to year to year? Because we've had athletes who start off with wanting level seven, level eight, and they get to high school and they're like, eh, it's just not really for me, but they're just painfully pushing through, uh, you know, DP levels because like they think their parents going to get upset with them. They thought that I was going to get mad. I'm like, listen, I just want you to be happy. Like if you want to, you want to go to Excel and like do four other sports and each other social activities, like that is amazing. I just don't want to be on the wrong page when you're leaving early for something, but you're telling me you want to stay in level seven or level eight. I'm going to feel bad because I don't think we have enough time. You know what I mean? So like open mm -hmm. communication is just so important with Excel. Absolutely. And as I said, we, we have our progress reports, and we have, you know, goals for each event. And some events, it, I think it's a little bit more um, helpful on than others. Like floor has so many moving parts. You have mm. dance elements, you've got tumbling elements. And I have them usually at the beginning of the summer because they're fresh off of season and they have like these lofty goals. And they write down, especially like my higher level kids where it starts to matter. What do you want your tumbling passes on floor to be next year? What is your goal for next season? And then we write them down. And I kind of tell them right then if it's realistic or not. Like if you're telling me you want to do double backs on floor and like we're don't even have a full, like I don't know, you know, we're gonna, I'm like, eh, maybe we need a little more time than one one summer to get that. That's a big skill. <laughs> we don't just throw that one. That reminds um, me of summer camps, not to throw up like kids come to summer camp for a week and they're like, what goals do you want to full? Like I want to learn a back layout, a back double full and a double double. You're like, all right, we could try to get that. Maybe you get the layout. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry to interrupt you, but that's reminds me of <laughs> Yeah. Camp. Well, and, and sometimes, like I said, I don't ever want to like tell somebody their goals are crazy. Sure. Um, and like I said, we will get there. If you put in the work, if it takes us six more years, we'll work on it. But I have to tell you like what is safe and what's realistic for you and where you are right now. And then we do, especially with my older kids kind of have to have that conversation. Okay. So this is the end of season. We're going into summer. How much are you going to be here in summer? Mm. And some of them will go, I'm going to miss this week and this week and this week and this week and this week. And you know, they're going to miss all but two weeks of summer. And I'm like, so we're not going to upgrade much with yeah. that in mind. Like we got to kind of, maybe we should, back our goals up just a little bit and put this as like a goal for maybe by the end of season, we have this skill or this pass and that kind of mm. thing. And yeah, I think and being able to do that ahead, really helps. Sorry, I interrupted because I thought. <laughs> Go ahead. Yeah, I, I think that's huge. And and having it on paper and then kind of revisiting it temporarily and periodically uh, and being able to go, okay, you know, we're here. We didn't make it. Do you even still want to do this skill? It turned out you're kind of scared of it and you didn't know yeah. that, you know, when you wrote it on paper. And revisiting it and keeping them flexible, but also kind of reminding them like, hey, this is what you told me you want to do. I'm pushing you because you said you want this skill and we can't do this big skill, this D level skill or this C level skill, like kind of halfway doing it. Like you got to be all in or we need to pick something else. So yeah. And the amount of work going again. around the skill, right? Like all yes. the drills, all the physical prep, yes. all the extra time. Like it's not just the, you have to do 10 of these kind of things. And so linking this back, I think a lot of people are now curious. We've opened the, not the Pandora's box, but the question of, okay, like, well, what is a, what does a practice look like to get these goals, these expectations? So let's kind of go back to that. I think you said you have like three, a little, like three and change for practices for these, this level is how do you break up those three hours when they're coming twice per week to get the good warm up, the drills, the physical prep, like a strength program in, like, what does that look like a little bit to give people some more like concrete thoughts? So if we're talking about the silver, so they have that six to seven ish hours. Um, I don't have any say in what the actual schedule or rotations are. And I think that's probably true for the majority of coaches who are not the head coach in their gym is you're kind of at the mercy of what you're given. And so for starters, just like really having a good plan, however often you want to change it. I like to do every like two months, except um, in season, I don't change it much at all, um, especially with the younger kids because usually we're, you know, catching up and maybe we progress a drill a little bit, but we're not like doing major changes with yeah. kids that young. Um, and it, it works out to be roughly 30 minutes on every event, a 15 minute warm up, 15 minutes at the end to stretch 30 minutes of conditioning, 30 minutes of vault bars, beam floor in that order, or not necessarily in that order, but, you know, kind of just broken up, spread all over the place. It's not usually the same from day to day. 
Uh, I'm not always with the silvers. I will say that. And this may be something that some of the other coaches run into. Like when it comes to, we have multiple levels in there at the same time, I get put with the higher level that I work with. Uh, like they are going to be the ones that I end up with. So somebody else might do my lesson plans for those groups. And so I kind of have to look at it when I'm planning it out and go, okay, I need to get all this done. This person can handle this. This person can't handle this. You know, the person who's working with them is a really great spotter. They don't know how to spot these skills yet. So like mm-hmm. that needs to be on my day. They will do really well at this. Like we have some people who, you know, they've been coaching for a long time, but they're older now. So they maybe right. they don't really spot much, but they can nitpick a leap or something like that so well that I'm like, okay, yeah. Give them that because that's what they do well Mm. and give me spotting back handsprings because I can spot the back handsprings. I'm hands on like that's kind of more in my wheelhouse Um, and dividing it up that way. And I like to use five to 10 minutes of every event um, as something that is super basic, whether that is like truly basic, tumbling basics, but it's rolling on floor. We roll a lot. (laughs) You'd be surprised that kids can't do that one anymore. So like it's keeping skipping. rolling in there and it, yes, like the skipping and it leads to so many other skills. If you can't stay in a, in a tuck shape, doing a forward roll or a backward roll, how are you going to do a back tuck? Like, sure. And kids don't get that. And they're like, why are we rolling around? We can do that. And I'm like, um, you're not doing it as well as you think. So we're going to keep doing it. Um, but you know, rolling in the super basic stuff, the kick lines and the chasses and the skipping, we still do that mm. skipping in our warm ups and that kind of thing five to 10 minutes of every rotation being on that. And I would say, especially with the low level developmental kids, I spend so little time on routines, truly. Um, When we're in season, I have two days a week, 30 minutes each on floor with them. We maybe do two routines a week, maybe. Right. Uh, After I've taught them the routine, that's where we get to. And I focus on the skills more. And of course I want them to look good and to do well and to be confident in their routine. So we try and do just enough to get those things, but I have to think forward. Okay. Are we going to be ready for gold? If we have this beautiful choreography on floor and we have no skills. Mm -hmm. And I think that's one thing that um, Excel gives us the flexibility to do, make the routine simple, let them do what they're good at. Focus on what you need to do to get to the next level, to get to the next skill, to get to the next progression and build that. So I said five to 10 minutes on basics every time that leaves you 20 minutes. Set up quick drills. Don't spend 10 minutes of your rotation setting up Mm. things that are complicated and take forever. And then you have to explain it. And now you've explained it and you've gotten the kids spread out because they're eight and they want to talk to you and they don't want to like stand in the line. And then you have five minutes left to floor and you've done nothing. That's (laughs) that's the biggest part. It's like know your plan. Spend some of it on basics, make it simple when you only have 30 minutes, when you have 20 minutes, when you have whatever it is, get it done, get them some numbers in. I dig it. I dig it. So we'll go in reverse order, then we'll summarize it backwards. So like that was like, <laughs> talked about strength, then events. And then what about warm up? So 30 minutes in a warm up is that like home roll stretch, run dynamic stretch, or is that just like right to it? So we have 15 for most 15, of our warm ups. Uh, Sometimes I will say this, and I, I like when this happens for us, is it'll be like 15 minutes to warm up and conditioning is right afterwards or strength sure. is right afterwards. And that is such a good flow, I think. And I can base the warm up on what they may be doing in their strength session. Like maybe mm-hmm. we just jog and we stretch really quick, or maybe this day we need a longer warm up. Maybe we're actually going to floor. And I kind of base it on that. But we have just a couple of things that we switch between something basic to get their heart rate up, jogging, simple, whatever especially in the off season. So in the summer and in the beginning of fall, it tends to be something really general like that, a quick stretch. And I spend that time teaching them what I want them to do in a competition and they memorize it so that it takes me maybe six weeks to get it to them and to get them to know it on their own. But then when we go to a meet and I'm in the coaches meeting, they know what they're doing. They're not like standing there looking around, you know, nobody's stretching. I come back and they're not ready. (laughs) <laughs> that kind of thing. So we're teaching that. We want them to know those things. And then once they've got that, I start teaching them one of our dynamic warm ups. And I have a couple that I cycle through and I'll start them with the easiest thing I've got. Um, it's super basic. It's like a quad stretch while you're walking across the floor and some kicks where you turn your upper body, you know, kind of stretching your hamstrings and your back out at the same time. And a couple of things. And I'll have them memorize that one. And then when we walk in, I can go, OK, jog five each way, line stretch. And they know what I mean. 
they know their dynamic stretch. That's the one that goes right before if they're doing their strength work first. Or maybe I say, okay, we're going to floor first and we've got routines today. We're going to do our competition warm up. Like, what do you need to do? Who's my leader? Let's go. Mm. And so we got 15 minutes. We get it done. We're stretched, ready to go, ready for the first event. The older kids, it's a little bit more complicated. We do have more of that dynamic warm up kind of stuff. Sure. Um, we almost only static stretch at the end. Mm. I don't think you need that much of it before practice, especially if you're doing your strength and your conditioning stuff first. Yep. Um, I would agree. You can get away with that with just some dynamic stuff and then save your splits and your your more cool down kind of stretching <laughs> for the end. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. So it sounds like, and correct me if I'm wrong, just to kind of summarize this in a, in a good little blip is, so this, with the preference of you have to do all your research before to like know what drills you want, what they look like, what math and equipment. And you also need your, your uh, head coach or whoever to give you the schedule well in advance of this, but yeah. good solid 15 minute warm up, dynamic warm up, stuff like that, jogging, and then 30 minutes of each event where it's five to 10 minutes of basics and then 20 minutes of like three to four well done drills or skills or stations. And then three or four of those. And then a half hour of conditioning at the end, which is those circuits maybe where you have three, you know, three circuits or sorry, three stations in one circuit. Then you switch to three and another one, three to four sets of eight to 12 reps somewhere in there with pairing and stuff. And then cool down stretch. That sounds like the basis of a three hour. Yeah. And maybe it's in that order. Maybe it's, you know, maybe conditioning sure, halfway through the day. You don't know, but yeah. you're planned for whatever it is. And you plan each event individually. And I like to look across, like I coach floor and vault. Um, so if I know that on vault, I'm doing a ton of running drills to kind of get us prepared. That's my basics for that day on vault. Then maybe on floor, I'll make our basics handstand shape. So those mm -hmm. both apply to both vault and floor. Right. And I've kind of like divided my time. Okay. I've got five minutes here on running and I've got five minutes here on handstands. And now I've gotten both of those in and I only took up five minutes of each event. Mm. Yeah. I think, I think basics and um, physical preparation stuff when you have limited time is so important to build into the workouts. Like kind of like, I don't know why this analogy comes up, but it's like sneaking kale and like your kids like smoothies and stuff yeah. like when they, but like in the warm up, there can be a couple body shaping things in there. You can add some core work in there and some strength. You can add some side stations. Like one of your four stations on bars can be some sort of compression or leg lift. One of your four stations on floor can be a handstand shaping strength thing. Like there's a lot of ways to sneak those things in when you don't have the extra two, four, six, eight hours throughout the week. Sometimes building those in is really the only way you're going to get some of that stuff in. And if you sprinkle a little bit in the warm up, a little bit in the events, and then you have your actual strength stuff, you, you can get a lot done in in three hours, like a ton done. That's exactly what we do. There's a little bit of handstand shaping in the warm up that they typically do at a meet because they need it. <laughs> and also, it kind of I think gets their brains ready to do gymnastics. Mm. You know, it's specific enough that they're doing that, but it also is part of your dynamic warm up because now you're you're doing the shaping, but you're getting those muscles like moving and working. And you're getting the blood flow going there. Mm, I love it. So the last thing I want to kind of tackle before we go six hours long on this is that uh, um, I think people really enjoyed your uh, lecture from the symposium because it was, it was a good blend of like the gymnastic specific stuff. And it was also a good blend of, of the general stuff. And for sure, I think core work gets the most attention in gymnastics, but also it's probably the most misunderstood. Like there's definitely a yep. benefit to leg lifts and compression work and stall. There's like that, that specific strength for gymnastics, but it's, I think people generally just don't even understand how the core works and or what the core's main functions are. So when they see people doing farmer's carries or, you know, bracing work or like, like deadlifting, for example, and knowing that's core work or sled work, it doesn't make sense to them. Like, why would I waste my time on a sled or a loaded carry when I have to do leg lifts? Like I just need four sets of 25 leg lifts and then half leg lifts and then full leg lifts and then compression leg lifts. And like, I'll be fine. I'll never have back pain and I'll have the best, you know, kip cast handstand in the world. But like, can you imagine if more core work was all we needed for no back pain? Like, man, every, no gymnast would have back pain like ever, but you'd be out of a job. <laughs> Staggeringly, it's the, I know exactly, <laughs> right? I treat a lot of people for back pain and I promise you they're doing a lot of leg lifts. So, um, yeah, let's start first with, can you give a little overview like you did in the symposium of like what the core structure is and like what it is built for? And then we can dive into some specifics. Yeah. So one thing that I think is really important to remember is how many muscles actually make up the core. And I think mm -hmm. most people, if you just said name the muscles of the core, they're going to name the rectus abdominis. And then they're probably going to be like, uh, maybe your obliques. Like that's kind of where the list ends. And it tends to be the stuff on the outside and in the front that you can see in the mirror. Um, those kind of six pack muscles, the things you think of when you think of somebody who's just like shredded yep. and that you can see and you forget that there's muscles underneath those 
um, that work really hard and that you have muscles around the back and that your diaphragm is part of it. And diaphragm is really a big muscle and you have a pelvic floor diaphragm and you have, you know, you just have so many things Lungs. that really go into, <laughs> yeah, Lungs so many <laughs> things that go into like what your core actually does. And that's just the muscle groups and they attach in different places and they pull in different directions. And I think there's a lot of that that's misunderstood. And I don't think that every single gymnastics coach is going to be able to master every single muscle of the body and be able to like draw it on a diagram and tell you exactly its origin and its insertion and the kinds right. of things that we had to do in school. And I don't necessarily think you even need to get to that level. I just think you need to understand in overall terms, what the function of the core actually is yeah. and how many things it really does. Yeah. Um, it matters for breathing. It matters for what you think of in gymnastics with the spinal flexion and the spinal extension. And it matters for lateral flexion, you know, going side to side, but it also resists all of those same movements and you create pressure in your core so that you don't leak power when you're trying to tumble. Uh, just all of that stuff that's so wrapped up in so many different things and it's so nuanced. And there's so many more exercises that have to be done besides just leg lifts. Yeah, Which, exactly. This is a public service announcement, but just because you're shredded and have a six pack and you're lean does not mean you have a strong core. Like there's not, not a single thing that correlates of a gymnast who's lean and has an eight pack to they have a strong core. And I, I think you're right. You have to remember at a baseline level, it's a canister and its job is to protect your spinal cord. As much as gymnastics is fun, yep. the, the main job of the, of the core is to make sure your spinal cord stays intact. And so it will do anything it can bracing wise to do that. Like gymnastics is a very secondary thing. Like and if you understand, oh, it's a canister, these muscles should work together to brace that canister. Diaphragm breathing is important. And then pelvic floor is important. Like then you start to conceptualize like what the like why it's important to train these types of ways. And I think something that maybe gymnastics coaches miss is if you train your global core and you're doing some of these things that we've been talking about, the heavy carries and deadlifts, and you're doing dead bugs and some of these things that 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 focus on core coordination, that focus on your global core, you're going to get better at the things that you think of that are super specific to gymnastics. Mm. I don't know the last time I did a leg lift. I don't do those in my workouts anymore um, now that I'm not doing gymnastics. And I've been out of gymnastics for 15 years. But I helped um, Dr. Sloan do a presentation not too long ago. And she was she needed somebody to do a leg lift in an example. And I got up there and I did one. <laughs> It's been 15 years, but I can still do it and I don't work on them and I can still do a kip on bars and that kind of thing. And I'm not saying that like you should take all leg lifts out of out yeah. of your core work because I think being able to make those actions happen is important. But I do think you have to realize that leg lifts are mostly, especially if you're doing them like on a stall bar, which I think a lot of us are, are more like your lats and your hip flexors than they are your actual core. Sure. Is that important to swing bars? Yeah, but you can't. Um, be misled into thinking that that's a big ab exercise when it really not using them all that much mm. at all. Yeah. I think what happens sometimes, and I was very guilty of this is if you don't understand the principles of like what the core's role is and what it looks like and all the things you have to train the different motions or muscle groupings, you get into this like FOMO Instagram based. I need all these drills and you have 94 exercises and 84 of them are all for the same thing. They're all for the front or the obliques. And you also find yourself very overwhelmed at practice because you're like, you feel like you're constantly missing something in coaching. Like we had to do leg lifts and lower leg lifts and then side plank lifts and this and that. And I saw these four drills from this coach and I want those. And then I saw these on Instagram and these on YouTube. I went to Congress and saw these. And then you have a 90, like 90 minute core circuit. And you're like, I have no idea <laughs> what I'm doing right now. It's like so stressful. So the, the better way to approach it is understand, like you said, it's a canister, top, bottom, front, back, side to sides. And you need to work both the gymnastics specific, like flexing and extending, but also the opposite of that, which is the not flexing and the not extending. And so those, it's like a tree branch where you have like, okay, two main buckets, then you can build out exercises underneath that and make sure that each one of those types of things shows up inside of a, a workout throughout the entire week. That's a better way to go about it. Then switch the exercises out and, you know, make it work here and there. But yeah, I think that's a better way to approach it than being like, here are all the drills, you know, like here are 400 yes. drills. And one thing that I think is really important to mention when we're on the subject of leg lifts is leg lifts being so hip flexor dominant. And if you think of how many other things that are required to do good gymnastics are also hip flexor dominant, all of your split jumps and your leaping and all of this other stuff, and you're doing so much with just your hip flexors. And now you have kids who have hip flexor impingements and yep. they've got just insane quad tightness and these different things. And it's because they're just using this one muscle group constantly for like four or five hours straight during the day. And they're not actually making the things around it any stronger. 
And then you've got, you know, now we're pulling on their back, their lower backs because their hip flexors are so tight. Now we've got back problems because of it. And mm. then you think you're making them better by adding more core exercise, but you're actually making it worse because you're adding the things that were feeding into it in the first place. And yeah. it just turns into a nasty cycle and it's all well-intentioned. And that's the part that I think is hard for people. They're like, well, I'm trying to help them. And I'm like, I know you are. Yeah. Let's slow down for a second. Uh, Let's back I, up. <laughs> I can't tell you how many kids I treat that literally stretch every single day and do so much core work and so much leg lifts. And they have like just the ragingly like tight hip flexors and groin muscles. And they're like baffled at why and they just blame it on genetics, like must be genetics. It's like, or it's like capsular based over stretching and like way too many hip flexor dominant things. Like maybe we should do some plank crawls instead of leg lifts, or maybe we should do something else. That's not, and that happens with shoulder flexibility too, not to be off topic, but like, you know, someone's like lats are super stiff and their T spine super stiff. And it's like, well, what's your, like, what's your upper body pulling program look like for your scaps? And it's like, well, I do rope climbs, leg lifts, uh, pull ups, pull -ups. reverse pull ups, monkey pull ups, legless rope climbs. And it's like, anything but your lats, maybe anything possible yeah. and it makes sense of why someone's like you know walking around like a turtle shell so i don't think again yeah you and i are both saying like, it's not about abandoning those things like we can carve out one half of that tree real easy like you should do leg lifts and stall their lifts and l seats and arch ups and side planks and plank crawls and sliders that's great do them all it's fantastic compress press handstands but like you have to have the other stuff which i think we can talk about you know more how to balance it out but the same way you lift two days and maybe you do general two days you should be doing specific core work maybe in your warm-ups or in your gymnastics yeah. days but you should be doing non non-gymnastics general core stuff in the off days because that makes you better an athlete i love to use the specific things uh more as drills for an event so like i yeah. think leg lifts are great for like you know, getting your toes to the bar quickly for a kit, that kind of thing. Um, whereas I don't value it that much as an actual core exercise, but I do value it for helping you learn some of the skills that you need on bars. And so for me, putting a couple of like quick sets of five speed leg lifts in a bar warm up, like I see the value in that for yeah. sure. Whereas I don't see the value in doing three sets of 20 leg lifts just to like make you tired and your yeah. core and your core workout or your ab conditioning and that kind of thing. Yeah, no, I yeah. agree. And I think Nick and I have had some long conversations here because the higher you work up in the levels, the advanced core work does need to come more for compression, yeah. like scalders and stuff. But if you can do, if you can build a habit around, there's always some core in the warm up, whether it's like uppers, lowers, together, hollow holds, arch holds. Um, there's some sort of like daily dozen workout. Now we're kind of moving past the six to eight hours per week because you need more time for this. Mm -hmm. But like, 15 minutes of Nick's daily dozen, which has some staller work, has some compression work. And then you have side stations built in. And then maybe you sprinkle a little bit of extra core work in those couple days that are gymnastic specific. That is a ton of core work. That is like a ridiculous amount of like very specific shaping for the core. And you can use the other opportunities to build the generalized stuff, you know, the, the stuff that's probably gonna help you more. But like, I, I just don't think people realize like when you land on beam and don't fall off, that's not how many leg lifts you did. That's like loaded carries. That's like side. Yeah. Stuff. That's like general core work. That is not that is definitely not how many leg lifts you missed out last week. That's how well you're able to coordinate all those muscles to work together. And so many of your core muscles cross your hip joint, cross your shoulder joint and that kind of thing. And people don't think of that as how much your core actually stabilizes, like all the way down to your ankle, you know, just by the way your body is connected. And so many problems that I think people would never blame on the core um, that maybe don't don't have that educational background are, blame, are, are actually your core not being coordinated enough to create that pressure when you need it mm. to stabilize the hip joint when you're landing a skill. And now we've got knee problems or now we've yes. got ankle problems and that kind of thing coming from it. And you're looking at your knee and you're trying to strengthen your knee and you're trying to work at your knee. And you're missing the fact that like this kid can't like activate their core muscles at all. Mm. Yeah. And I can, I can say from the medical side, I just talked about this yesterday with one of the students. It's like, I think I've treated a thousand gymnasts for back pain at this point in my career, which is terrifying. But out of all those people, maybe 10% of them truly had needed more core work. Like they're yeah. naturally hypermobile. They're like the floppiest of the floppy. And maybe they're not the most, you know, disciplined to show up to practice. Like there are people who have back pain because they're like the, the like the wet noodle type category. But 90% of the people that I treat, more core That's strength not is not what's going to make their back pain more. Not at all. It comes down to like, workload management they're doing 5000 back walkovers and back handsprings they have no conditioning program that's like balanced out at all and they have no like general core work to go around it for their legs and stuff it's literally like workloads and basic strength programs are what they need it's not yeah. this crazy shit with their is like leg lengths <laughs> and scar tissue it's, it's mind blowing to me the treatments that people get sometimes i'm like bro you're just doing too many back handsprings it's the middle of season and you're doing 5 million back handsprings and you don't have any like off season strength training program that's it that's it yeah 
<laughs> save your money, go home. We'll and that's one thing that I would say so many of these kids, especially when they get to the high levels, they've been doing a skill a certain way for so long. And they've, you know, <laughs> like a back handspring, we'll keep that example. So maybe their shoulders are a little bit tighter. And so their low back just takes so much of the brunt of that load every time their hands hit the ground or the beam or whatever they're doing it on the vault table. If they're your Chinko kid too. Yeah. And over time that stuff catches up to you. And it's not that your core is weak. I would say maybe in the general population, you get most of your back pain from your core being weak, but we're talking about sure. some of the strongest athletes there are yeah. um, in gymnastics. So like, that's not going to be the case most of the time. And until you address the rest of the problem, is it the shoulders? Is it the lack of core coordination? What is it that's causing this pain? You're just going to keep running into it. And no amount of physical therapy is going to fix it without fixing the root of the cause. Completely agree. I completely agree. And I think there's equal parts to blame like I'll blame myself as a younger medical provider who did like transverse abdominus slide outs. And I thought I was like the man, but also like measuring leg links. I did all that stuff. I learned like three years of all those courses. And then I got to be a little bit older. I'm like, I'm just so not even on the right planet right here. But like, I have yet to see a case of back pain. I think in this order, it's cultural problems where the gym is just toxic. That's part of it. And they just do way too much. And nobody listens to like reports of pain, workloads, flexibility, basic strength programs, and then techniques and basics. Those five yeah. things. I think if if, it's, if you go through all five things and like you don't hit a single thing and you have no why, then we'll have a conversation around maybe you're a nuanced case. But like 95% of the gymnasts with stress fractures and disc issues, it's one of those five things or a combination yeah. of those. Absolutely. And as so much of it is just, it's not even one single thing you did. It's what you did over time, which you did that back answering that way for 10 years. And it just caught up to you now. And that stinks, but yeah. it's going to take some time to kind of undo what you've already done. Yeah, I hate to break it to people, but the elbow OCD epidemic and the number of stress fractures we see and the number of Achilles stairs, they're not genetics. Like no. I can't, I go to like a bunch of clinics and people are like, well, they're, it's definitely their round of technique and genetics. That's why they have elbow OCD. I'm like, or it's the, the 15 to 20 volts and beam back answerings they do per night, six days a week for a year straight with no cross training or no, you know, break in the season. Maybe that's it. One thing that's really interesting. And if you're an Excel coach, like I am, um, you can like pat yourself on the back for this one because I've noticed in the really well-run Excel programs, you have fewer of those injuries. Like you just don't see them as much. And I think a lot of it has to do with the extended timeline. I mm. get kids to your Shinko vaults, but they're older when we get there. They've yep. got more of that baseline strength already. Um, in my gym, I know to like, look at their shoulder flexibility. Like maybe this kid doesn't need to do a Yurchenko. They need to be a suit kid because otherwise we're going to end up with elbow problems because sure. they, they truly do have tight shoulders. Um, or they just simply don't have good enough round up back handspring technique. And as much as we've tried to fix it, we're not getting anywhere with it. Yeah. We're kind of, you know, it, we can make it work on floor, but on vault, it's just going to continue to be a problem. We're going to jar their back. We're going to jar their elbows. We're going to ruin their wrist. It's not worth it to me. Not yeah. in this level, not with there's not college um, SEC D1 like goals on the, on the docket here. Like yeah. it's not worth ruining them and, and having to deal with that for the rest of their life. Cause so many of that, so much of that stuff will follow you forever uh, in mm. some level. Um, and I do think like not rushing into things and having the flexibility not to have to, you don't have a compulsory routine where you have to do a round up that can spring, even right. if they're really not ready for it. And now you broke an arm. Right. Um, that stuff is so helpful for being able to help kids to get to those skills and be healthier when they get there. Yeah, uh, And then again, we do have shorter hours. So the numbers do tend to be lower and the workload is a little easier to manage on top of all that. Yeah, I will definitely stand up for coaches and say, I think there's still a massive educational problem where like a coach needs to have this skills and the tool set to understand how to screen out someone's limited overhead mobility. Like if you've never taught a coach how to screen a T-spine or how to screen shoulder mobility and then what to do with it with like evidence-based stuff, that's not for a coach to do to go down PubMed and find like 800 research articles. Like that's for medical providers to do and digest into palatable form for coaches and summarize for them what to do. They have so much on their plate. So like I see that point of view. If I wasn't a medical provider, I'd be drowning just as a coach. But at the same time, I, I just, I don't know if I'm just getting like old grumpy boomer now in terms of like how long I've worked with, but like I just, I'm so frustrated sometimes by some of the conversations that you hear about like in groups and online. It's just like people are just so so like not in the right camp it's like yo no the problem is we're asking 10 year olds to work 20 hours 25 hours per week and the stuff we have them do is insane when they're going through puberty mm -hmm. like that's the problem like year-round specialization early like all the, like the year-round training stuff the 
20 to 25 hours. Like these are freaking kids, man. These are children. And we're asked them to be elite athletes. Like maybe that's the problem. Like, no, it's definitely the roundup technique. It's definitely that. I'm like, what the, it's just not true, bro. This is just not true. And I wish I could like get that through to people. Like, I agree. Let's not turn our hands this way in a round off because sure, we're putting more stress on our elbow. Definitely. I'm with you on that. But and like good research on that for sure. Yeah. By itself, that's not the <laughs> only problem here. Like we Comma. have to look at the fact that we did 200 round offs in this practice, all of them with their hand turned out like that. Um, or you wanted them to fix turning their hand out. So you made them do like an extra 50 on the side where they fixed their hand, but they still did an extra 50 round offs on the day. Yeah. Um, Particularly the growth plate stuff and like the stress fractures yeah. in back. Like it's just so hard sometimes because I, I'll, I'll see someone who comes from three, four or five other medical providers about like a growth plate issue, like a gymnast wrist or a back stress fracture. And like what they've been told will fix it. It's like, well, these exercises and these breathing things from PRI will fix your anominate rotation and it will make your back better. I'm like, or you're 12 and doing a lot of back handsprings and you just need to take a two months to chill and go be a kid and like not work out 40 hours per week. Like, no, nah, I think it's the PRI stuff. I'm like, okay, okay. <laughs> this sounds good. I'm like, what do you want me to tell you, bro? It's yeah, painful. I don't know if you saw this. I think it actually came out today or maybe yesterday. Are you familiar with Dr. Andrews? He's here in Birmingham. It's one yeah. of the, the big. Okay. So very well because Mike and Lenny own our clinic and they studied oh, under I Kevin. About for, that. <laughs> yeah, they invented the rehab for Tommy John together. Yes. But, but yeah, it's quite familiar. <laughs> he put out a, a whole thing. Um, in the last couple of days, I just saw it today about like, please stop doing this to your kids. He's like, I don't want to fix them anymore. Like, this is ridiculous. And so yeah. I just thought that was hopefully coming from him and how well known he is for, you know, working with these high level athletes, kids, teenagers, all the way up to the major league and the professional sports going like quit. <laughs> Please yeah, stop doing uh, this. Hopefully the, people the will listen UCL, to that. The UCL Tommy John problem is like getting trending lower and lower and lower. So like 16, 15, 14 year old kids are tearing the TJ and we see them all. Like my boss treats, my, the two of my bosses who in our clinic treat probably a hundred Tommy Johns, you know, easily between them uh, per year. And it's all just like, it's the same problems in gymnastics, which is why I'm actually like some of the stuff that I got famous quote unquote for is just Mike and Lenny's problems with baseball reflected on gymnastics. Like, yep growing too much. You're, you're not strength training enough. You're, you're doing like these kids play summer ball and then they go to fall sports ball, ball. and they play all baseball, Spring. right? <laughs> it's the same thing with gymnastics, right? It's just literally year round gymnastics all the time. And you know, you put kids on a hamster wheel of success when they're younger about like, all right, this level, that skill, next one, next one, next one. Uh, it, it's crazy. It really is. And I think we're seeing things change, which is awesome. But like, it's just still, I just don't think a 12 year old tiny body is designed to do your chanko foals. I just yeah. don't. And I think some of that comes from it's top down pressure. And I feel like it's always been that way for as long as I've been in gymnastics. And I mean, my own career too. Um, the coaches that were at the top when I was competing and kind of influencing on their way down, how everyone else did things, they had to be their way. And it didn't really matter how many kids yeah. got broken on the way to success. This one won. So like, yeah. we got to listen to this. Um, but also I would say college, like the college yeah. recruiting is crazy and expecting agree. these kids to be in a certain place at 12 years old or even by their sophomore year of high school when they can officially, you know, kind of start talking to them sure. now and expecting them to still be there eight years later when they graduate college. When you have kids who peak, you know, 16, 17, 18, and you kind of already passed them over because they weren't level 10s competing the highest level level 10 skills at 13 or 14. Mm. Um, yeah. And I will go back and say that you can train your Chanko fulls, but competing them on hard, I think is where the yeah. problem comes up. So I just want to clarify that before my comments get lit on fire. Um, <laughs> I knew what you meant. <laughs> yeah, I, I did too, but it came out and I was like, I can understand that's going to go sideways. Um, and it is getting better. I will say like the college yeah. situation recruiting is getting better. And I, I actually think, um, you know, I'm fortunate to look at a lot of programs and see people. And there actually are a lot of people who are doing it the right way. I think the symposium was actually a really cool collection of people who are like a lot of the speakers on, on both days were, you know, working with elites, like really high level mm -hmm. kids who are 13, 14, 15 on the, on the elite track and are doing well, or have really successful college histories, have multiple D1 scholarships and the kids are healthy and they're enjoying it. And they're having fun. So, you know, I think there's a way to do it. I think it's just still a, a quite a, a whirlwind here of culture meets, you know, education meets, you know, the ability to be open to change and understand how things can evolve a little bit. But it's getting, yeah. Better. And I think, Again, we're going back to kind of screening kids and making sure they're truly ready for skills. There's probably 12 year olds out there that are like physically and mentally ready to do your chinko pulls. Mm. I don't think there's a lot of them, but I bet there are some. 
there's a whole lot more that aren't that are being yeah. like taught those that young. And, sure. you know, they, like I said earlier, they're killing their wrists and elbows and their backs. And then it catches up to them at 17 and they work so hard for that long. And now they're going to like lose their last year of gymnastics because they're in so much pain. And can they even hold it together to go to college now? Or how many kids um, or girls, and probably guys too. I don't know as much about Definitely. men's gymnastics, but no, you're right. I'm going to They you right get now, right. to college and they need, four surgeries and they're holding it together with a whole lot of tape and they're, you know, physically in so much pain, just trying to get through four years and they need it. They need the money or they want it or whatever. Or it's their yeah. dream that they've dreamed of since they were little. And so they follow through with it versus the girls who never got a shot or the guys who never got a shot, who actually peaked at the right time to be healthy and at their best during college, but they're not on the team because they weren't there at 14, 15. Yeah, I think it was the 2016 goal study that showed from the NCAA, they like survey all the incoming freshman data. And they said that freshmen um, had the freshman gymnasts had the most, the highest rate of severe injuries requiring surgery prior to coming into college, like 70% of them required like a major uh, surgery or like ACL tear shoulder repair. And I think they also said that freshman incoming had the highest rate of like uh, narcotics use. So like ibuprofen and like heavier like pain medicine to get through whatever they're doing, which is like, yeah. It's terrifying, right? Like yeah. obviously the Achilles debate is ongoing where like college blames club, club blames college, but it's both. It's for sure both. Mm -hmm. No doubt. Yeah. I don't know how we got this conversation away from the I don't either. <laughs> no, let's keep going. <laughs> this is important. We'll, um, we'll, we'll finish that back up first, which is do loaded carries, uh, sled work, D ball carries, squatting and hinging, and you'll work your core to get along with the gymnastics specifics of all right, check. We can and you're better prepared to do all of the high impact stuff that doing too much of too young is going to result in all these problems later. See, we wrapped it back up. <laughs> yeah, this is actually a good loop, right? Because I actually <laughs> do think if you look at like, what's the opportunity to change general, and this is like a hill I'll die on. And I keep trying to tell people this. And I think a lot of people are moving towards this. But it's like, if, if we know that 10 to 14 is an absolute, it's just carnage for a lot of young kids in gymnastics going through puberty, growth plate issues, mental blocks, puberty is a nightmare. You grow, you, you change dimensions. It's super hard to get used to that. 10 to 14 is one of the most opportune times to slowly introduce a general strength conditioning program and spend some time in the summer doing that and spend more time doing that and pull back from competition and pull back from training super, super hard. You can still work stuff and train and compete a few times per year, but doing you know, when you're 12, 13, 14, 15, when your body's changing, doing eight meets per year and then going to state regionals, nationals, maybe it's not a great idea. Maybe all those qualifiers are not a great idea. Maybe we can take a step back, develop your skills, build in this general strength conditioning to get you through puberty. And then you come out of 15 and you're, you're an absolute monster in a good way. Like your, your flexibility comes back after puberty. You're stronger. You're more powerful. You're more cardiovascular fit. We know that from a lot of research studies. Maybe that's the model we need, which is like, let's, let's, let's spark plug this in right when you're 12 years old. So 12, 13, 14, 15, you can, you can be good. Yeah. And I've seen that in my own gym and I mean, just everywhere, everywhere, like my own career. Again, uh, I remember watching some of these same things happen to some of my teammates. Um, in our gym, one thing that I have to say that we do really well is they don't make the same mistake twice a lot. You know, sometimes we do things and I realize it was wrong and then fix it and we do better the next time around. And I know like the first time that we had girls trying to go elite and they, I mean, they were so ready skill wise, like they yeah. had the big skills. Um, great girls. And in the end, neither one of them actually ended up competing elite. One of them, I think, chose to come back down and just do level 10. And she did end up going to a big SEC D1 school. Um, and she's there. And the other one got so burnt out and had so many injuries that she just got frustrated coming back from that. She didn't even make it to her senior year of high school. Mm. It was just too oh. much. And I think mentally, that's really hard on those girls who work so hard to get there and they put in the work. And, you know, things just don't go their way in the end. And coming back from that, and I don't think it's wrong to not come back from that. I feel like I should say that. Like, sometimes getting into that situation makes you realize what's actually important to you. And sometimes it's not what you thought it was. Mm. Um, and I think trying to make those decisions at 10 years old is hard. Like, yeah. whose, whose dreams are these, really? Are they yours? Are they the kids? Are they the coaches? Are they the parents? Because um, what 10-year-old truly knows what their dream school or their dream skill is? Yeah. And when's it going to change? Probably um, tomorrow, maybe next week at the longest, like they might keep an interest for that long, but it's, yeah. it's hard to put all that on a, on a, such a young kid. Yeah. I, I do see a lot more coaches who are level headed and have, you know, their own life figured out and they're more humbly approaching the developmental stages, which is fine. But I mean, the reality is that we still have a lot of unfortunate situations where the goals being pursued are in my opinion, seeming more about like what a parent can talk about and brag at a dinner party over wine when they're, 
half in the bag and what's going on at a bar after a meet about who's bragging to who about who won what. And it's less about what the kid actually wants. So yeah. like, we got to check that. I think, again, we're moving away from that. We've seen a lot of that fall, fall away, which is great in the last, you know, 10 years, but you know, that it's, it's about always what the kid wants, no matter what. And you mm -hmm. are helping them to that common goal. It's a joint partnership. You know what I mean? It's not, it's not for anybody else, but what they want. And I want to jump in on that and say, like, I worked with a girl this past year who um, really wanted to go to college. She was in our Excel group. It's just practicing 12 hours a week. And if you saw the core presentation, you heard me talk about her a little bit. And she did. She got some offers for some of the new programs and some of the D3 schools. She turned down schools. Um, they weren't where she wanted to go or in the right part of the country. And she didn't like the culture of that particular school or whatever. Um, but she had been with with our group and doing our practice schedule and kind of what our expectations are. And, you know, it is a little bit more fun and laid back than level 10 would be uh, on the other side of the gym. And her last year, I had to be like, look, your goal changed. These are bigger goals. You're not doing the same level of gymnastics as they are anymore. Like I have to be harder on you, but it's because I want you to get where you want to go. And sure. I think being able to have those conversations and as coaches shift back and forth, because that's hard when you have a mixed group, especially if you're with Excel and you have those kids who like really want to be at the top and the kids who aren't just there for fun yeah. and you have to coach each one of them and not coach the whole group, the exact same. I think that's tricky. Um, yeah. Going back and forth mentally as a coach going, okay, this kid, I have to be not hard on in a bad way, but you know, like yeah. I got to hold this one to this standard and this one's just here for fun. So I need her to be safe. I want her to do well enough at a meet that she's not like in tears by the end of it. Cause she's just scored sixes or, whatever it is, you know, and her whole team is scoring 37s. Um, and I need to keep the culture of the group positive. If I'm like hard on you guys all the time, or if I seem like I have favorites, that's not going to help anything. That's going to be a really negative situation. And nobody's going to understand why I'm treating people differently. And I think just, I mean, truly back to that open communication, knowing each kid, knowing what their goals are, having that stuff clearly like written out, however you want to do it and coming back to those and going, okay, look, this is the goal. Is this still the goal? Mm. And if it's not, that's okay. If it's not the goal anymore, let's change the plan. If it is still the goal. Okay. We've got to do something to get closer to where we are. Do we need to work harder? Um, do you need to get more sleep at night? Cause you're coming in here exhausted. Mm -hmm. Like, can I help you with time management? Are you staying up until midnight every night and i've had this happen kids staying up until like midnight 2 a.m trying to get their homework done because they don't get out of practice until almost nine o'clock they got to drive home they got to eat dinner um now it's 2 a.m because they're a junior in high school and they're taking really hard classes and i'm like if i let you go 30 minutes earlier every night like i know that you miss the last part of this event that you're caught up on and you miss stretch do you promise me you'll stretch at home while you're doing your homework and yeah. like get them the extra sleep and that's what they needed to be successful and i think not being afraid to like kind of go out of the norm and do some of those things. It, it makes a world of difference. Yeah. And that goes back to level setting, level setting expectations, right? Like you're not yep. being mean to someone and being harsh, but they told you they want this goal and your, your job as a coach is to help keep them safe on the pursuit mm -hmm. of that goal. And sometimes that is a tough conversation about like, Hey, look, like fires a little bit more, you know, we got to shuffle these chessboard pieces around and figure something out because right now it's definitely not going to end well because we have so much to do. So that's not, it's not yep. there's a difference between being mean there and being like honest. Yeah. And I think that makes a big difference. Being honest, being able to have those goals already written out and set and be able to come back to them so that you can make it as an objective conversation yeah. as it possibly can be and kind of help them understand why you're saying what you're saying and not just like feel like you're all of a sudden mad at them for yeah. some reason. That's something that would have been OK two months ago or would have been OK last year. They don't understand. They just think that you're mad at them and they don't know what they did. And so I think that's a big thing. It's, the older they get, I think they understand more, but definitely the younger kids, they don't know. Sure. You gotta be really like open yeah. with them for sure. I have no idea what's going on sometimes, but yeah, okay. <laughs> no. it's part of the lessons, right? Yes. Um, well, we've gone an hour and a half and I can sit here and talk <laughs> for another hour and a half, but we both have lives and things to do. So we'll chop it up here and we'll go okay. on. To it. But uh, where can people find you on the socials? Um, I got two Instagram accounts. So my at lift heavy princess one is kind of my main one. And that's the one I'm the most active on. Uh, and that is general strength and conditioning. And a lot of it's geared towards powerlifting and, just training principles in general. And I really try and kind of um, teach people over there, teach the why behind why strength and conditioning things are done a certain way. And then I also have LHP gymnastic strength, which is more gymnastic specific. So um, you can message me on either one. I answer, <laughs> I answer both. I try and keep them uh, both logged in all the time, but 
those are the, probably the two easiest places to get me. And if you ever need anything super specific and you don't do Instagram, you can email me. My email is Christina at LiftHeavyPrincess.com. Sick. Fantastic. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for chatting. I appreciate it. Absolutely. Thank you. Have a good night.